Hey everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0. Uh, I did a whole lot of work around uh, Venus this week, uh, making many, 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 many uh, arrow breaking passes um, in very high Venus atmosphere so as to not uh, overload the heat shield and uh, cause wanton destruction uh which resulted in this life support pod being able to make this rendezvous and then this uh not quite as slow as it should have been uh approach to docking there's just a a little bit of a nudge there and a, a little bit of a scrape but uh eventually we'll we'll back things off and uh start to get things more or less aligned uh we did have lots of success uh, arrow breaking these things and really just had to keep the uh, altitude uh, somewhere above 115 kilometers or so and uh, you got some pretty good arrow breaking there's a nice camera shot looking through the uh, hab module on ostrich station here in uh, medium venus orbit it's a, a very eccentric orbit because well we ran out of fuel but we'll just uh Slowly nudge it in, let the magnets take hold, and boom. Life Support Pod 1 is now officially attached to uh, Ostrich Station here in Venus orbit, which means we are green to launch the crew next Venus window to start uh, performing on-orbit Venus science and uh, taking care of really uh, knocking out a, a lot of the science and research and uh, sending a crew to another celestial body besides the moon or Mars, which is the uh, only two places uh, crews have really been in this save, uh, despite it being three years. So I think it's well and about time for us to get a crew out here to Venus and start doing some serious research. Uh, there was the ejection of our orbital capture stage. Uh, it was completely empty. Actually, I guess I had forgotten about all of that. But uh, with that thing done and gone and uh, a little bit of debris created with the decoupler our second life support pod will go on ahead and make its approach there's a lot of back and forth switching off between these two pods while they both simultaneously made their uh, arrow breaking passes and their subsequent uh, burns to make rendezvous here uh, this one came in probably about an two or three orbits behind the first one which was, honest to God, seriously surprising. And for the sake of symmetry, I took the extra time to bring it around to the far side of Ostrich Station to hit uh, this specific docking port so that we could keep the uh, load on everything relatively symmetrical. And uh, it makes me feel better when things just uh, come together very cleanly like this. So with a, a little bit of a nudge and a little bit of a correction, we have two of two life support pods docked to Ostrich Station, which means this thing has enough life support to support six crew for about a decade, which is seriously awesome. And there's our screenie of the day. Fantastic. I cannot wait to crew this thing. Awesome. Well, that's a good step one. And uh, on to step two, I figured I'd, uh, while I was in Venus orbit, uh, we jump out here and check our map set that was launched from the bay of a uh, Shuruken Mark 6 uh, C not too long ago. It has uh, been in orbit for more than a year now, so it has had absolutely every opportunity to complete its mapping mission, which uh, it has done. Its map is finally, finally complete. So we'll just uh, warp around a little bit until we get our radio in command. And uh, this is my new problem with some of these mapping parts, I guess, um, because I have actually done this around or experienced this around Titan also, I should say. Uh, this footage is massively <laughs> sped up. Believe it or not, I know it doesn't look that way, but I promise you it is. So for the sake of my sanity, I will speed it up even more. Thank you, post-render. Anyway, uh, this 
800 or so science took a extraordinarily long, long time to radio in. As you can watch that number very slowly creep up as we will complete um, a pretty good chunk of an orbit of Venus while just kind of sitting here, hanging out, me staring at the screen. This did take uh, quite a bit of my record time this week, which was absolutely infuriating because uh, at the end of it all, it uh, didn't even bother to give us credit for it. No science points earned. And uh, that was me rage quitting that mission. Uh, I guess I'll try it again later because the data was still there, ready to be radioed in. So at some point, maybe it'll give me credit for it. Anyway, uh, we're going to spend a good deal of time out here uh, between Jupiter and Saturn dealing with our, um, I don't know, distant planet surface explorers series of missions. These are all carbon copies of our Ganymede lander uh, that was ever so successful. So we sent uh, two more to Saturn to uh, try to land on Enceladus and then uh, one more to Jupiter to try to land on Callisto. I'm really hoping I got that right and didn't confuse anything. Anyway, we are uh, out here at uh, Jupiter making a plane change to put us on a very nice course for uh, intercept to make a uh, gravity assist flyby of uh, Ganymede, which I think will be our very first uh, gravity assist target for this vehicle. So we'll just uh, go ahead and try to dial in our next node here out at our uh, Apoapsis until bang, there we have an encounter. We'll uh, fine tune that in just uh, a little bit, uh, provided of course that we have the time to do so. But uh, while we're here, we'll just uh, get a few things set up as far as our sciencey bits. Take a quick save that takes exceptionally long because KSB has been running for multiple hours at this point. Thank you, Orbital Rendezvous at Venus and uh, Radio In of data that just won't cooperate. All of these things are absolutely wonderful. But uh, so we will uh, instead switch out to the exact same vehicle, this one in orbit of Saturn. Uh, this is one of our Saturn moon surface explorers. You'll notice that we have no connection currently with this particular spacecraft. Uh, this is the one I forgot to turn the dish on uh, as we were departing Earth. And so it is uh, operating 100% autonomously at this point. Uh, thankfully, we did program in the uh, orbital insertion data before it left Earth SOI and we lost contact with the vehicle. And so it has brought itself out of hibernation mode and it is making its uh, close approach to Saturn. An absolutely spectacular view coming in just outside Saturn's rings. Uh, yeah, I did spend a disproportionate amount of time just kind of in awe of all of this, but we had a solid light on our uh, HA-10-118K to make the uh, 1300 meter per second burn to place this spacecraft in a highly eccentric orbit uh, with our uh, ascending descending node with Callisto right out at uh, what will become our apoapsis, which is going to make this uh, plane change maneuver relatively cheap and relatively quick, but uh, Provided, of course, I really feel like it was way more legitimate if we make contact with the spacecraft. Uh, this thing is actually out here to fulfill a contract, and part of that contract is being able to radio science back in from its landing. So uh, if we want this mission to be successful, we absolutely need to find some way of turning on this dish, which would be crucial considering it is way better off than its uh, sister mission which is uh, also here in Saturn orbit it uh, made its orbital insertion burn a couple of episodes ago but we are actually very close to this old mission here Wanderer Alpha which made uh, flybys of many of Saturn's moons until it ran out of fuel and has just kind of been here on station keeping doing nothing but it is very close in range to our little wanderer. So 
we're going to go ahead and, or this is Wander. It's very close to our little Saturn Moon Surface Explorer. So we're going to kick on this dish. We're going to set its target to active vessel and hit activate. That's going to take a, uh, I don't know how long the signal delay is because I can't add seconds. Uh, we'll bring up flight computer in a little bit. But if we uh, kick on these Omni antennas, uh, their range compounds with each other. So maybe, maybe, maybe if these things kick on in the allotted time, an hour and some coin, maybe we can make contact with the uh, Saturn Moon Surface Explorer. Here's hoping. Let's just uh, time warp out until we uh, clear this list. Make sure all of our little Omnis are in range. Okay. Loading. Loading. Come on. <gasps> we have contact. We have contact. Oh, my God. Act quick. All right. Set target. Earth. Kill. Activate antenna. Oh my god, did this actually work? Were we able to boot the spacecraft up from Saturn orbit? Alright, an hour and 24 minutes until this dish activates. Oh, and it's already packed, so it should... Oh no, no connection. It worked! Yes! Yes! Oh my god, I cannot believe that worked. Holy crap. We have actual live comms with this mission now. I'm not a cheater anymore. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Holy crap. <laughs> well, uh, after my minutes of celebration, we'll go ahead and plot this node to make its uh, plane change maneuver. It is in a very, very long time. And uh, we're going to go ahead and adjust its orbit out to be uh, in line here uh, with Enceladus. Just uh, We'll just go ahead and try to make our braking, our gravity assist passes uh, at our target as we did with our Ganymede lander. Because, well, hopefully it will just work. But I'm very glad that this mission is officially back on track. And we can now go check in with our Jasper mission. Now uh, this is, of course, the uh, Jupiter Atmospheric Science Return something or other. Uh, it is basically intended to gather data from the upper layers of Jupiter's atmosphere. It did make a little bit of an aero-breaking pass on its way into Jupiter. It didn't quite aero-capture because we didn't get nearly low enough to make that a thing. But it has these two very lovely drop probes one of which we're going to eject here very soon, but the very first thing we need to do is uh, set up our comms. So uh, the return portion of this spacecraft will boot its antenna and target active vessel, and we will fire the decoupler to separate from one of our little drop probey friends. There it is. We had to wiggle the spacecraft a little bit to get it to detach. So we'll reset flight computer and uh, boot these antennas. It's going to take about 38 minutes for those to fire up. Uh, all the while we are drifting away, we should probably give it a little bit more unique of a name just to make it easier to find amidst uh, all of the chaos here. But our uh, Jasper mission itself is going to make a burn at Apoapsis to raise its orbit up so that hopefully it can maintain comms both with Earth and with the drop probe as it goes screaming through the atmosphere to what is uh, inevitably a crushing, fiery death. Uh, hopefully not before it can radio in some quality data for us. Anyway, uh, I'm going to turn you over to old me. Ullage, ullage, ullage. Insufficient resources to ignite. What? Nah, -uh. this thing has unlimited ignitions. What do you mean insufficient resources to ignite? Yeah, it's not even trying to light this engine anymore. Throttle is pegged open. Yeah, okay, thanks, Kerbal Alarm Clock. I, I needed that right now. I 
I'm confused. So we're clear here, there's no actual test flight data on this engine, so it shouldn't have a failure rate. But yet it has failed. Well, that's interesting. All right, then. Uh, well, I guess we're just going to go ahead and make the rest of this correction on RCS. God, it seems so wasteful to do this with RCS ports. And that does go uh, limiting the scope of the rest of the mission by quite a bit. I it was like, I didn't pick the wrong engine. There's no ignitions field listed here. But for some reason, the dumb thing just won't light. This is probably an... an F5, F9 kind of situation, but to be real honest, we've got other things to worry about, and uh, maybe we don't need to bump this orbit up nearly as much as we think we do, uh, and just so we all know, we still have lots of fuel in our two lateral tanks that are currently locked. Uh, we have way more than 235 meters per second. Uh, let's just go ahead and kill that node. This is probably good enough. Uh, it really, it depends a lot on Jupiter's, or our orbit's relation to Jupiter and its relation to Earth, which is currently wandering down that line. So, but we need to go jump out to our uh, atmospheric probe. All right, let's unlock these fuels. Let's get ourselves angled into retrograde and bring that periapsis way the hell down. Tap. Tap. Oh, too much. Way too much. 171 kilometers. Yeah, no, I was looking for more like three quarters of a million. We have no reverse thrusters. So if we turn around. Okay, good. It's going lower. Now it's going higher. Oh, great. 1.23. All right, let's just call it there. Lock these tanks. Good enough. This thing will go back into hibernation mode until we get much closer to Jupiter's atmosphere, at, when, at which point we will set up uh, our flight computer to do all of its radio in checks. We'll probably just spam the radio in command until the dumb thing dies. Uh, fiery, crushing, terrible death. So let's just add a maneuver out here. That should give us a couple hours of lead time so that we can program in flight computer. I'll set another node before periapsis. Nah, we don't really need it. No big deal. Anyway, that'll be fun. Set our alarm clock. There we go. And uh, now we can get back to doing uh, some of our other missions. All right, so at the node, it's one hour, 15 minutes, one day and eight hours until our encounter with uh, Ganymede. That's going to provide uh, some fairly significant gravity assist to uh, slow our orbit down. Our uh, ultimate target here, as soon as KSP does its garbage collection, is Callisto, of course. Uh, I'd like to get our orbit down to about here-ish before we start raising our periapsis and doing the rest of our uh, gravity assisting off uh, Callisto herself. But we have this uh, very nice flyby coming by of uh, Ganymede. Of course, we already have a lander on the surface of Ganymede, so we don't really need to gather much science, but we're going to do a very close buzzing freestyle <laughs> flyby at a very, very low altitude. So I figure we might as well take the opportunity to try to catch some science. This maneuver node has a zero delta V associated with it. So we'll just go ahead and eliminate that real quick. Uh, I do want to uh, get ourselves within range of our Ganymede encounter so that we can set up flight computer to do a bunch of radio in. So we'll just uh, fast forward on it until time for that. That seems about close enough. Let's uh, bring up flight computer. We'll set our first delay two hours, 17 minutes until we make 
windfall. So we'll set this for two hours, 18 mic clear. Uh, we'll adjust our action group down here to group 10, which is radio in and hit toggle. And then let's uh, set up for our periapsis, which is uh, two hours, 51 mic. And 15 seconds, we'll just go ahead and clear that now. And then uh, hit toggle again. And wait until three, two, one, toggle. Maybe we'll actually get that on the way out. And uh, what are we looking at here? Three hours, 25. So we'll just uh, reset this to three hours, 24. Come on, KSB, don't mess with me like that. Clear and uh, toggle that again. And then we can jump back here and uh, make our flyby. Let's find a good, oh, oh yes. That is in fact, very good view. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and warp on in and enjoy the scenery. It's like we're being dropped out of time warp here. Uh, two minutes until our action group. There's our one minute warning for SOI change. So it looks like we're right on schedule here. Finally figured out how to target things. Yes, yeah, space high over Ganymede's Midlands. Uh, let's go ahead and close out flight computer. Uh, we'll reset that one. Reset. I thought I saw something generate some data in here. Yeah, it doesn't look like we're over a good biome. Oh, gravity scan. Well, it's space high over Ganymede's Midlands. We'll net us about 40 science. That's totally worth it. Let's go ahead and radio that one in. Boom. Done. We're set. And biological sample. We obviously are going to reset that one. So uh, what is our total uh, periapsis there? <laughs> Whew. 34 kilometers. So... Uh, we're going to really come in and buzz the surface here. Pretty, uh, pretty close. Orbital period, 39.73 seconds. Oh, well, that doesn't seem right. We're also not in orbit, so, you know, I guess that's a thing. Oh, yeah, coming in. Base darts. I wish I had better things to say during these things, but I'm just kind of lost in how pretty it is, except for the Z fighting on Jupiter that's been here since day one. It really looks like we're going to hit the surface from that angle. How long until our next radio in? Flight computer will tell me 45 seconds. How long until periaps is 31.8 seconds. So I still missed it by just a little bit. Space just above Ganymede's cryovolcanic ice. Oh, please don't clip something. We're totally not too high, right? No, we're fine. We're, we're totally good. But man, look at that. Just look at it. Did we get a radio in? One second off. There it is. Let's go ahead and close out flight computer. Biological samples. Probably the only thing that's going to net us anything because we've been here before. But... Oh, and there's Io rising in the distance. And Europa. Oh, cool. Much better picture. Wow. Yeah, we're on our way back up. So in the clear, so reset, 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 reset. And uh, that was worth really nothing but the eye candy. Oh, the eye candy. All right, let's go ahead and warp on out to our next doohickey, which is in 32 minutes before we leave the SOI. Just get one last high-pass science. 
Although, yeah, we could have gotten Midland or Lowland or more cryovolcanic. I think we covered all of these biomes with our previous lander, which is a, a carbon copy of this vessel. I'm sure I've mentioned that already. Good day, Ganymede. Thank you for the assist. Greatly appreciated. There's the shot I'm looking for. Those droids, however, I never did find. Anyway, uh, that's going to do it for this episode, everybody, as we uh, leave poor Ganymede behind us and uh, get ourselves set up for our next maneuver node. It uh, does not immediately result in a flyby, but it does bring us pretty close. And so if we let this skip an orbit or two and then uh, make some very small corrections, uh, we'll see our next flyby of IO. We'll just go ahead and dial this in a little bit to s make sure we don't smash into the surface, but uh, also come in on the correct side and come in appropriately low. It does give us a pretty healthy gravity assist. So anyway, we'll set our alarm. That's going to do it for this episode, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out. I really do appreciate it. And I will see all of you in the next one. So until then, see you later.